Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dede Lucheto. I'm professor and chair in public health here at UC Irvine. And uh, welcome to our seminar series. Many of you have heard this throughout the quarter, but every now and then we have guests, so I have to keep saying that. <laughs> but also, we always thank the Office of Extension for recording all of these seminars uh, for our Open Courseware program. It's a real legacy of uh, distinguished speakers and presentations and participation by the audience. I was just observing uh, to somebody last week that we don't get a lot of questions from the <laughs> students in the audience. So uh, we'll make that a requirement next year some, somehow. But feel free to uh, interact. Partly, I think, because we offer lunch at the end of the presentation, so people reserve their questions mm -hmm. for that period. That's OK, too. Uh, and it's another opportunity to interact with the speakers and uh, to share your views, build your network, and um, the open course where allows us to share this with the rest of the world. It's one of the most uh, viewed uh, programs uh, on our website. Uh, the seminar series is made possible by the generosity of our faculty and students who have already built uh, a strong network of collaborators, uh, colleagues across the country and the world. And today's speaker was uh, nominated by Dr. Brandon Brown, who uh, just this last Saturday at the Undergraduate Research Opportunity Program uh, Symposium, um, the list of public health uh, presentations, abstracts, posters, uh, almost research was uh, more than we've ever had uh, in the history of the program. I think we had about 40 or 45 um, different presentations. For those of you who are there, you know what I I mean, and uh, this is in no way uh, possible if it weren't for the work of uh, Dr. Brandon Brown, who's really invigorated our undergraduate program. And we look forward to uh, launching our PhD program, which also has a track in global health, which is a specialty. And uh, many of you will be taking classes or uh, just research programs, or just emailing to find out more about what he does. So, Without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Brown, who will introduce us to Okay, hello everybody. We're very fortunate today to have Dr. Jamila Stockman here with us for our seminar. Uh, Dr. Stockman is an infectious disease epidemiologist and assistant professor at the Division of Global Public Health in the Department of Medicine at UCSD. She was recently selected as a fellow for the HIV Intervention Science Training Program for new investigators uh, at Columbia University. She received her MPH from George Washington School of Public Health and her PhD in Epidemiology from the world-renowned Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I have to say that because I also wonder, it's world-renowned. <laughs> so Dr. Stockman's research focuses on HIV prevention with a specific um, focus on the role of intimate partner violence and substance abuse among low-income, underserved, vulnerable women. She is currently addressing these intersecting epidemics among substance-using and ethnic minority populations in San Diego, the Mexico-U.S. border, Baltimore, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Dr. Stockman is also conducting research on the continuum of sexual violence and associated HIV risks with the goal of understanding the context of such incidents and subsequent engagement in HIV risk behaviors. She plans to extend her research agenda into and development of HIV behavioral interventions for targeted groups of women most at risk for HIV, including ethnic minority and drug using women. I first met Jamila at UC Irvine at the first UC Global Health Day conference and met her again at UCSD while I was uh, completing my short postdoc research project in Vision of Global Public Health. She has been very successful in securing NIH funding and we hope to collaborate on new projects in the future. Today, Dr. Stockman will be presenting on partner violence among methamphetamine-using women at high risk for HIV. 
So please join me in welcoming Dr. Stockman to UCI. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for providing me with this opportunity to be here today. Uh, this topic of violence against women is very near and dear to my heart. I developed this interest way beyond my undergraduate training. And I've been fortunate and blessed to be able to continue to develop a research agenda surrounding these issues among vulnerable populations. So with that, today I will be sharing with you findings from a secondary data analysis that my team and I conducted. And what we sought out to do was examine the prevalence and uh, associated HIV risk factors of intimate partner violence among HIV negative female methamphetamine using women in San Diego. So feel free as I move forward with this presentation to interject with any questions or concerns as well as comments. Um, often when presenting secondary data analysis, it's hard to save all of your questions to the end. So feel free to interject. So with that, first I will provide an overview on the intersecting epidemics of intimate partner violence, methamphetamine use, and HIV. And then discuss a little bit about the research study design that we used to conduct the secondary data analysis and share with you the findings related to the prevalence of not only intimate partner violence, but other types of partner violence. I will also share with you the findings related to associations between sexual and drug-related HIV risk factors and intimate partner violence, and conclude with a discussion of the study implications related to both research and intervention development. So first, let's talk a little bit about intimate partner violence. How many of you know what that is? OK. So of the individuals who raised their hand, can you tell me what you think intimate partner violence is? I had two hands over here. <laughs> Raised. <laughs> Doesn't have to be perfect. I could take a guess. Okay, Brandon. <laughs> so, um, violence with somebody who you're intimate with. Mm -hmm. And is there specific types of violence? I believe the violence could be um, mental attacks and perhaps also physical attacks. Okay. Okay, so anyone else want to add on to what Brandon had to say? Sure. It could be like emotional or verbal abuse. Okay. Anyone else? Go ahead. Um, sexual abuse. Sexual abuse. Okay, good. So you all named a few of the different aspects of intimate partner violence. And really what it is is defined as the physical and sexual abuse and threats thereof perpetrated by a current or former spouse, significant other, steady partner, or um, live-in partner. When we think about physical and sexual abuse, physical abuse often refers to being beat, hit, choked, um, burned, use of a weapon. And sexual abuse occurs on a continuum of severity. So there are less severe forms of sexual abuse, such as being pressured into sex because you think that's an obligation of the relationship, being threatened into unwanted sex because your partner has threatened to withhold resources, such as financial resources and housing. And he, he may or she may also threaten to, have take, to take the children away. And then you have the other end of the spectrum where there are more severe forms of sexual abuse. And those forms are really with the use of physical force and literally being held down or beaten and forced into sex with a partner. Now, intimate partner violence can take place in the context of heterosexual relationships as well as same-sex relationships. Today, I'm gonna to focus on the more heterosexual type of intimate partner violence often perpetrated by a man. So now let's move on to discuss a little bit of the statistics behind intimate partner violence. 
In 2010, the CDC conducted a national survey on intimate partner and sexual violence. And what they found, uh, first, it was a probab probability-based sample of men and women throughout the United States. And they found that approximately 36% of women reported ever experiencing intimate partner violence. And when we break this down into physical and sexual violence, nearly one in 10 women reported ever being raped by their intimate partner. And about one in four women reported experiencing severe physical IPV at any point in their life. Now, someone mentioned psychological, emotional, or verbal abuse. That is an entity of abuse in general. But when we think about intimate partner violence, we're referring to physical and or sexual abuse. When researchers and clinicians talk about psychological abuse, in addition to physical and or sexual abuse, that's often referred to as intimate partner abuse. So that's the distinction. And today I'm not going to get into psychological abuse. I'm really going to focus on physical and or sexual intimate partner violence. This same study conducted by the CDC found disproportionate rates of intimate partner violence among some, some racial ethnic groups of women. In particularly, African American women were overrepresented in terms of the prevalence of uh, intimate partner violence, as well as American Indian, Alaskan Native women, and multiracial non-Hispanic women. So IPV often results in a number of adverse mental and physical health effects. Can anyone uh, tell me some of the mental and physical health adverse effects that may result, as an, uh, may result from um, intimate partner violence? Brandon. <laughs> Post-traumatic stress. Yes, so that's a mental health effect, right? Any other physical health effects that anyone can think of? Sure. Sexual dysfunction. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And there's a, a number of physical health, adverse physical health outcomes from cardiovascular health, so more chronic conditions, uh, traumatic brain injury, in addition to PTSD, depressive symptoms, suicidality, um, adverse reproductive health effects such as miscarriages, and someone mentioned sexual dysfunction. So there's a wide range of, of mental and physical health consequences. There's also sexual health consequences, and the one that I'm going to focus on today is HIV and sexually transmitted infections. So now let's turn our attention to methamphetamine use. What does this look like? What does this picture look like among women? We know that worldwide methamphetamine, or also known as meth, is the most widely used subgroup of amphetamine type, of, type stimulants. It's more common than opioids or cocaine. In the United States, the 2005 prevalence of lifetime meth use was approximately 9% percent and current prevalence estimates was reported at 0.3 percent. Geographically, um, where do you think meth use is more prevalent? If you look, if you had to think about the United States, would you think more meth is found in the East Coast or Midwest or South or Western U.S.? more of a rural urban divide. Okay, that's a good point. That's really good. Anyone else? San Diego County. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent guess. So, you know, both of those responses are really good. Matthews historically has been more focused on the Western United States, although there is some stabilization occurring, and it's been more focused in, you know, more rural environments and suburbia. And, you know, nowadays it's more dependent on what drug is available. So historically, meth use was more common among white men and women. Now it is equally as common among African American men and women. And that really has a function to do with what drug is available in a particular place, such as San Diego. 
So what's important to note about meth use is the proportion of female meth users is nearly equal to men. And female meth users have a very distinct risk profile. They're mo most often younger, come from lower educational backgrounds, and they're more likely to be married. Female meth users also are more likely to have been introduced into meth by a significant other or intimate partner. And when they begin, it's more sporadic, but they eventually begin to become more frequent users of meth compared to men. And they often initiate meth use as a way to control their weight, specifically to lose weight, and to cope with depression. In addition to being more frequent meth users in uh, comparison to men, they're more likely to smoke meth versus snort or inject it. So some of the adverse health effects uh, associated with meth use include suicidality, mood disorders, depressive symptoms, some of the same adverse health effects you see when you look at women who have a history of intimate partner violence. But again, related to this talk, the most significant adverse sexual health effect is HIV, sexually transmitted infections. So when we look now at the intersection of intimate partner violence and meth use in women, it's been noted in numerous research uh, that these two epidemics occur in a bi-directional relationship. For example, women who use meth often use it as a way to cope with the mental health effects of intimate partner violence experiences, as well as to deal with the psychological pain that they're suffering as a result of intimate partner violence. Alternatively, women who are meth users are victims of intimate partner violence due to perhaps the unequal distribution of sharing drugs between her and her partner resulting in conflict and leading to violence, both physical and sexual in nature. So one study documented that meth use was involved in approximately 90% of US domestic dispute cases. It's important to note that this was among a select sample, so this was not a population-based study. Also of note, approximately 60 to 80% of meth using women in drug treatment have reported intimate partner violence. So if 60 to 80% of meth using women in drug treatment have reported such an event, just imagine how many meth using women who are out of treatment may report intimate partner violence. And this last point goes along the bi-directional relationship that I previously stated, that violence and coercion may result from meth using, meth using men's demand for riskier sex acts because meth often has certain effects on people, in particularly men. It may result in increased arousability, so they may become more forceful with their female partner. And also, meth has the ability to intensify emotions. So not only be, being forceful with your partner, but extremely forceful, intensified by the underlying emotions. So the bottom line, and this is not just limited to methamphetamine use, but drug use in general, the independent and joint effects of drug use and partner violence increase the risk of HIV acquisition among at-risk women. So now, let's integrate HIV into the mix. So we have now substance abuse, violence, and HIV among women. And this has been termed the SAVA syndemic, um, meaning substance abuse, violence, and HIV AIDS. And these three public health issues, again, they overlap at different levels. So here I've laid out a few of those different levels. There is an overlap of the drug and sex related HIV risk in the form of the following factors. Injection drug use, selling or trading sex for drugs, and also the engagement in high risk sexual behaviors. There's also relationship dynamics that contribute to HIV risk. And these relationship dynamics have to do with 
the woman's reliance on her partner for procurement of drugs and what that means. He holds more power than her in terms of procuring drugs. Also, with that unequal distribution of power, there's more room for the integration of partner violence, thus contributing to HIV risk. And then one study found that among drug-using women, the prevalence of physical and or sexual intimate partner violence was three to five times higher compared with women who did not use drugs. So you can see at these different levels, there are intersecting, overlapping roles of one, two, or three of these public health issues. Now when we look at the SAVA syndemic in San Diego, so San Diego is a very beautiful place, a lot like Irvine, a lot like Orange County. It's known as America's finest city. Um, population is 1.3 million, and it borders Tijuana. Geographically, which was a surprise to me, it's equivalent to the state of Connecticut. So it's very huge. Now, although it's a very beautiful place, it's not met with, without its problems. And some of those problems are substance abuse, violence, and HIV AIDS. Methamphetamine is the primary drug of abuse in San Diego. From 2009 to 2011, which is the most recent data that we have available, overdose deaths have increased as a result of methamphetamine use. Female arrestees who test positive for meth outnumber males at this stage. And in 2009, meth use accounted for approximately 30% of hospital admissions. Of approximately 4,000 people receiving meth use treatment, so enrolling in drug use treatment programs, of those 4,000, 55% were women. When we look at violence, there's high rates of physical and sexual violence among meth-using women. And I'm going to demonstrate that in our study findings. But not only based on that, the San Diego Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board reviewed a number of intimate partner homicides. So homicides committed by an intimate partner. And they reviewed this over a four-year period, um, I believe about 63 um, intimate partner homicides, and among those homicides, they found that over half at the time of the incident, either the perpetrator or the victim were under the influence of methamphetamines. So it's very um, problematic in terms of contributing to intimate partner homicides, the most devastating outcome of intimate partner violence. And then when we look at HIV AIDS, San Diego um, ranks the third highest in the number of HIV cases, um, AIDS cases in, Cal in the state of California. So with that, where are the gaps in research in terms of these intersecting epidemics and this population? Well, little is known about the prevalence of different types of violence by different perpetrators as well as intimate partner violence among meth users, and specifically among meth users who are enrolled in HIV behavioral intervention trials. HIV behavioral intervention trials are often designed to increase safer sex behavior, uh, so reduce sexual risk behavior, and sometimes they're also designed to reduce drug use. Well, if you're enrolling participants in HIV behavioral intervention trials that are also suffering from intimate partner violence and are currently experiencing that while participating in these trials, how are they able to reduce their sexual risk behaviors? How are they able to negotiate safer sex behavior? So this research is important because it may demonstrate that we need to address intimate partner violence, and even sexual relationship power differentials when designing such interventions. So that leads me to the study objectives. The first objective was to determine the prevalence of intimate partner violence and violence perpetrated by other types of sex partners. So meth users often engage in casual sex. They may have sex clients as well and they also may have anonymous sex partners. So 
we wanted to characterize the violence they experienced by these different types of perpetrators. We also wanted to identify sexual and drug-related risk factors independently associated with intimate partner violence. So this secondary data analysis came from the Fastlane project. And what this project was, was an HIV behavioral intervention trial for HIV negative heterosexual methamphetamine using men and women designed to do three things. Reduce high risk sexual practices, methamphetamine use, and depressive symptoms. The study occurred between 2006 and 2010 and it took place in central San Diego. The eligibility criteria, we wanted to recruit at least 400 participants, 200 men and 200 women. So that was the target sample size. To be eligible to participate in the study, uh, you had to test HIV negative at baseline upon enrollment, be at least 18 years old, self-identify as heterosexual, um, also report having at least one opposite sex partner in the past two months. And this was very critical, reporting snorting, smoking, or injecting meth at least once in the past two months and at least once in the past 30 days. So really being defined, that's how we define being an active meth user. For the current analysis, we focused only on women who were enrolled in Fastlane. And although the goal was to enroll 200 women, 209 women were enrolled. Individuals were recruited through a number of different methods, community outreach methods, advertisements in newspapers. Word of mouth was extremely popular in terms of recruiting individuals and referrals. Participants were randomized to one of two conditions. There was the trifocal cognitive behavioral therapy treatment group, and that group, trifocal meaning it focused on those three areas that I previously mentioned, the sexual risk behaviors, depression, and methamphetamine use. This treatment involved nine 90-minute face-to-face counseling sessions um, on a weekly basis, and then in some individuals were randomized to another group, which was the standard care comparison group, in which they received nine weekly face-to-face -face individual counseling sessions. And the standard care comparison group was modeled after previously funded, um, NIH-funded programs, such as Project Match, that uh, functions as a 12-step program for drug users. Um, so that was the standard care comparison group. And it's important to note for the treatment group, the type of interviewing or counseling method used was motivational interviewing techniques, which has been shown to be effective in terms of reaching substance abusing populations. Data was collected using audio computer assisted self interviewing techniques. Uh, we collected data on sexual and drug risk behaviors, mental health outcomes, abuse experiences, and there were a whole wide range of additional variables, but for the purposes of this presentation, I just listed the ones relevant here. Biological testing for sexually transmitted infections also occurred at baseline and 12 months. The STIs that were of interest were chlamydia and gonorrhea, and as well as HIV. After baseline en enrollment and assessment, follow-ups occurred at four-month intervals, so four, eight, and 12 months, so there were a total of four visits. For violence, the measures, there were two measures, really, that indicated physical or sexual violence. For physical violence, there was a single question that asked participants if they have ever been physically abused, hit, or assaulted. For sexual violence, participants were asked if they have ever been forced or coerced to have sex against their will. Now, can anyone tell me, because I don't have a limitation slide at the end, so I'm trying to address the limitations as we proceed through the talk. Are there any limitations that anyone can notice regarding the way the questions were asked? Let's take another guess. 
Yeah, okay, that. Brandon. <laughs> For um, sexual violence, uh, I guess if, if you're in a relationship with an intimate partner, maybe the person's individual definition of that might be under question. So they might feel, instead of saying that I was forced to have sex, it, this might be something they feel is obligatory. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to report mm -hmm. it as rape or sexual violence. So, in other words, it may be, the interpretation may be open, left up to the participant to interpret what this means. Okay. Anyone else have anything else to add? Okay. Well, I, I guess it depends on the age, but uh, sometimes people who are traumatized repress memory, so there may be recall issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So both of those are excellent points. So recall bias as well as leaving these questions open to the participants' interpretation. There's been a call um, in the violence literature to use more behavioral specific terms when uh, assessing physical and sexual violence because these events here, these questions, will probably capture more severe events, right? they are less likely to catch, capture the less severe events of uh, physical abuse, so being hit or assaulted, um, or forced or coerced to have sex against their will. What, what does coerced mean? So there was, the, the questions were just like I have them up here. Um, and then for both physical and sexual violence, so for both of these questions, individuals were asked to report on the first time they experienced physical and or sexual violence, how old they were, as well as who did it. And then to capture a lifetime experience of the number of times and the number of perpetrators, they were asked for both physical and sexual violence, what were the number of different, perp different perpetrators who perpetrated physical violence or sexual violence? and how many different times did this occur? So the number of different times. And then there were recent violence measures. The time frame for recent was past two months. And for physical violence and, and sexual violence, it, it got a little more behavioral specific here. So the questions were a little different. For physical violence, that was defined as um, cause or threatened to cause physical harm and there were examples provided, slapping, punching, kicking, hitting with an object, assaulting with a knife or other weapon. And then for sexual violence, this was defined as being raped, forced sexual advances, or non-consensual sexual acts. So it was a little bit behavioral, a little more behavioral specific, but not adequate still. These questions on recent violence experiences were asked for different types of sex partners, um, for spouse or live-in, steady partner, casual, as well as anonymous. And anonymous was defined as someone that they didn't know, essentially you know, someone they met in the park or a hustler. For our dependent variable, lifetime intimate partner violence, this was defined as physical and or sexual violence by a current or former spouse, live-in, or study partner. So the definition we went over earlier. So the analysis stuck with that definition. And independent variables examined were um, demographics, uh, substance abuse behaviors, sexual risk behaviors, and abuse history. We conducted descriptive statistics. Um, again, our focus was on IPV and associated factors. We used chi-square tests and t-tests as needed. Variables considered for inclusion into our multivariate model had to meet a p-value cutoff of 0 0.20 or less than that. For our multivariate model, we utilized backward stepwise regression methods. And only uh, variables who um, retaining significance at 0.05 level were um, in the final model. So now moving on to results. So of 209 women, the mean, um, the average age was 36 years old. It was a pretty ethnically diverse sample. Um, we were able to get uh, good representation from different um, racial ethnic groups. 
So 37% were white women, 27% uh, African American, 21% Latina, and the remaining 15% were multiracial or other. About 50% were never married, and um, about three quarters reported having at least one child under the age of 18 years. 29% um, reported no high school diploma or GED, and a large proportion, 80%, were unemployed. So when we looked at the lifetime prevalence of physical and or sexual violence, we created mutually exclusive groups here. And physical and sexual violence, astonishingly, I mean, it occurred, both those events occurred among 51% of women enrolled in the, in the intervention trial. 27% experienced physical only, 6% sexual only, and only 16% reported um, neither physical or sexual violence ever in their life. Now this shows the contextual factors. So some of those factors I previously described, the age at first incident, the number of times this occurred in their life, and the number of different perpetrators. So here, let's see the laser pointer. You have physical violence and sexual violence. And the median age at first incident for physical violence was 14, lower than that of sexual violence, which was 19 years. And then the median number of times this occurred in a woman's lifetime was higher for physical violence at 10 compared to sexual violence, three. And then finally, the median number of different perpetrators doing physical or sexual violence um, was the same for both types of violence, so three. So despite having this difference in terms of the number of different times it occurred, being higher for physical violence, 10 versus three, there was the same number of different perpetrators for both types of violence. So that's important. Now this graph shows the perpetrator of the first physical sexual abuse incident. So the orange bar denotes physical violence and the blue is sexual violence. So let's look at physical violence first. Again, remember this is the first physical abuse incident in their life. So the most commonly uh, reported perpetrator for physical violence was an intimate partner followed by a male relative. So the most commonly reported perpetrator at the first incident, an intimate partner, followed by a male relative. Now going back, the age, the median age at first incident was 14. So it's really young age, and to have that occur by an intimate partner, that's really telling. When we look at sexual violence, the most commonly reported perpetrator at the first incident was a stranger and other. Other, there was different names. Um, and so really, I don't really want to weigh into um, or give this category much weight. It's presented to be comprehensive alongside the data. But the take home message here is that for sexual violence, the most commonly reported perpetrator is a stranger the least common, which is what you would expect as a female relative. So this is recent violence. Recent violence defined as physical sexual violence in the past two months by type of sex partner. So we're shifting gears from being open-ended to type of perpetrator to now zeroing in on types of sex partners in the past two months. So again, Orange bars, physical violence, blue bars, sexual violence. And overall, in the past two months, 22% reported um, an experience of physical violence, and approximately 9% reported an experience of sexual violence. The most commonly reported um, type of sex partner for physical violence was a spouse or live-in, followed by a steady partner. And the most, for sexual violence, the most commonly reported sex partner was a spouse or live-in, followed by a stranger. Casual partner was the least uh, commonly reported sex partner who perpetrated sexual violence. 
So now this characterizes the dependent variable because we're going to get into the, the regression model. And the, among 209 women, 66% of those women reported ever experiencing physical or sexual violence by a current or former live-in spouse or steady partner. So we first looked at bivariate associations between sociodemographics and intimate partner violence. And really, there was no significant differences by any of the sociodemographics examined. I've listed two here and two on the next slide just to demonstrate this. So you can see um, IPV is the orange bar and no IPV, the blue bar. And really, n no racial ethnic differences were observed for those experiencing IPV versus those not. As well as marital status, the same sort of trend was observed with no statistically significant differences by their intimate partner violence history. And then here for employment status, I circled in red the most important bars, which what we care about is the unemployed, because we know that a large proportion, 80% of the sample were unemployed. So here, again, there were no significant differences by IPV status for um, those unemployed. And felony conviction is often common in this population. Um, in this sample of women, 209 women, about 23%, I believe, reported ever having a felony conviction. So we thought it would be an, an interesting demographic to look at in terms of IPV status, but there were no significant differences. So this slide, there's a lot of text here, so let me walk you through this. This shows the bivariate associations between sexual and drug risk behaviors and IPV. So the ends and proportions are presented in each of these columns for IPV and no experience of IPV, along with the corresponding p-values. And as I stated before, to be considered for inclusion into the multivariate model, 0 0.20 or less was our cutoff in terms of our p-value. So that's why the p-values at 0 0.20 or less are highlighted here. And the variables that um, were associated with intimate partner violence experiences ever in a woman's lifetime were having sex with a HIV partner in the past two months, being high on meth during unprotected sex with a steady partner, being high on meth during unprotected sex with a casual or anonymous partner, reporting anonymous sex partner in the past two months, reporting unprotected sex with a steady partner in the past two months, and reporting that their first, uh, reporting a forced first sex experience. However, it's important to note for this variable, it was assessed only among the women reporting a history of sexual violence. Okay, so moving on to the logistic regression model. Here we have the unadjusted parameter estimates, and here we have the multivariate model. So the variables that were highlighted in the previous slide were considered for inclusion, and these are the unadjusted odds ratios of those variables, those associations between sexual and drug risk behaviors and intimate partner violence. And here we have the final model, what that consisted of. So women who reported unprotected sex with a steady sex partner in the past two months were four times more likely to have ever experienced intimate partner violence in their life. Uh, women who reported a forced first sex experience were five times more likely to ex have a history of intimate partner violence. And finally, Women who were high on meth during unprotected sex with a steady partner were almost three times more likely to have uh, experienced intimate partner violence in their lifetime. So note the steady partner issue here. So what does all this mean? So let's first summarize the findings. We were able to demonstrate that there are high rates of physical and sexual abuse among meth using women in San Diego and abuse more generally speaking because of the, the first few questions. 
We also were able to demonstrate that the context of the abuse experiences are significant and relevant, especially in terms of looking at risk behaviors and trying to modify and change their uh, intimate partner violence experiences in terms of negotiating safe sex behavior. We were able to demonstrate high rates of not only intimate partner violence, but partner violence in general. So different types of sex partners, casual sex partners, anonymous sex partners, and sex clients. We also demonstrated that high risk sexual behaviors and a forced first sex experience are independently associated with intimate partner violence. And what's crucial here is high risk sexual behaviors with their steady partner. So future directions in terms of research. This intervention trial was designed to reduce depressive symptoms. So then wouldn't it be important, given the adverse health effects associated with meth use, as well as intimate partner violence, to consider the role of mental health in this triad? So we feel that the next step is to look at the data, which we do have data on depression and PTSD, and see how that looks in terms of being a mediator or moderator of the relationship between HIV risk and intimate partner violence. We also feel as though it's important to conduct event level analyses on violence in the context of high risk behaviors. This is already occurring, right? So we have assessments such as having unprotected sex while under the influence of alcohol or drugs. So that's context specific related to alcohol or drug use. Well, what about violence, having unprotected sex in the context of a violent relationship? There's no measures that are out there that exist that document that. So conducting event level analyses will provide a clear picture as to what is happening in, the, in, in that incident of violence and high risk sexual and drug related behaviors. We also need to improve our study designs. So, Epidemiologists always push for longitudinal research. We know it's very expensive, but it's very telling because we're able to draw causal inferences that we're unable to do here. This was an intervention trial, so it wasn't designed to look at the issues that our secondary data analysis looked at. Um, so longitudinal research study designs could lend some insight into the role of these intersecting epidemics, as well as qualitative research method to more thoroughly provide context as to the underlying mechanisms linking these associations. And what does this mean for treatment programs and future HIV prevention interventions? So we can conclude that women in substance abuse treatment programs need further assessment to include intimate partner violence. This happens sometimes, but it doesn't happen all the time. And they also need to be assessed for HIV risk. So the whole association between intimate partner violence and HIV risk needs to be integrated into these substance abuse treatment programs. Again, it's important to note that this sample was out of treatment meth users. So related to that, HIV prevention interventions focused on um, not only meth using women, but drug using women as well, need to integrate partner violence and sexual relationship power differentials. And that is my passion at this point, based on this data and the current funding I have from NIH that looks at, um, it, it brings in a qualitative approach to understanding among a subsample of women enrolled in this intervention trial who experienced the violence, I'm looking at how were they able to adopt the safer sex behaviors that they learned in this intervention, given that they're in violent relationships. So the next step then would be to develop an HIV prevention intervention that integrates violence and sexual relationship power differentials in the context of safer sex, not only sex, but drug 
related risk behaviors. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, the research team. Thomas Patterson, he led Fastlane. And Fastlane was actually, um, had 10 years of funding. So it started out, the first five years started out focusing on the same population, men and women, with the goal of just reducing um, sexual risk behavior and methamphetamine use. But then we noticed, oh, there's depressive symptoms that are highly prevalent in this population. So Fastlane 2 then was uh, funded to address the depressive symptoms in addition to the two previous elements. And now I've identified that, wow, there's violence here. So it's our hope that we can continue on and develop a, a more integrated intervention uh, specifically for, for women. Now, more work is to be done. I don't like to leave men out of the equation, but um, we do have data on men in terms of um, their victimization experiences, not their perpetration experiences, but victimization. And um, you know, I have yet to look at that data, but given the national CDC estimates that this is occurring among men, it would be interesting to, to find out what this looks like in a meth using sample of men enrolled in an HIV intervention trial. Also, Dr. Strathdee, um, she's my mentor at UCSD. Dr. Semple um, is the statistician who has worked uh, tirelessly and effortlessly on this project, as, as well as others. Dr. Zions was the project coordinator of Fastlane. Um, Jennifer Syverson, Natasha ludwig Brown um, were students who helped facilitate the completion of the secondary data analyses. And of course, we would not be able to do this without the study staff and participants. Uh, and also the funding sources, we, uh, the Fastlane project was funded through NIMH and I'm funded through NIDA as well as NIMH, D, NIMHD and NIMH. So with that, thank you. And I've um, listed my contact email address for anyone who's interested in reaching out. We have tons of opportunities for analyses, further analyses, um, as well as just general, if you want to share your interest with me regarding these intersecting ep epidemics, I am more than open to that. So thank you. Oh, okay. Still recruiting. No, so that, that, that's the um, disappointing news is that, you know, this program was a landmark program in San Diego in terms of reaching out to out of treatment meth users who lacked resources. And what Dr. Patterson created really was a drop in center for them. So it wasn't just research. They could come in, have coffee, they could use the computers, it was, they could socialize. But once funding ended, it, it has not continued on. And Fastlane won the first five years, recruited um, 400 as well. Now these, the participants in Fastlane 2, some of them had participated, but not all of them, and the majority of them did not. So that's how the structure is, unfortunately. I have a follow-up question. OK. <laughs> so um, all last week and two weeks ago, we've been hearing a lot about the military oh, yeah. and the uh, sexual abuse mm -hmm. in the military. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest surprises for me, and I think for a lot of people, is that there are more men victims than women. Mm -hmm. And San Diego, um, as you said, in the, you know, it's a lovely city, and all, but it's also a military city. Yes. And I wonder how many of your subjects mm -hmm. overlap with the military. Okay. So I can tell you that I don't think any of these ones do, actually. <laughs> um, 
And that's just basically based on our qualitative inquiry. We didn't examine or ask any questions in the quantitative sur survey about military background. So for this particular sample, none. However, another study that I have um, that focuses on African-American women in San Diego, since they're a very underserved, underserved group there, um, that study focused on examining that continuum of sexual coercion that I spoke about earlier and their adverse health effects and their help-seeking behaviors because they're such a marginalized population in San Diego. And what we found in those interviews is that um, a large proportion of women, so this isn't men, but women had military ties. So I know that there is the San Diego um, Family Justice Center that's located downtown. And um, as part of just so that I could get you know, informed about what was going on in San Diego when I moved there, I went and took a tour and spoke with people there. And one of the individuals who works there is a person who is um, sort of, she functions as a, uh, kind of an intermediate uh, individual between the military and um, the general community. So individuals who are in the military who experience such events, who don't feel comfortable reporting it to their commander or their um, first sergeant on the base, they can then go to the Family Justice Center and specifically speak with her. That's her role, a military li liaison. Um, of some sort, that's her specific role, and they can report it to her and seek all of the services from her. So that, she may have more data in terms of, of what you're trying to get at, but it, it is an extreme problem and uh, with a lot of underlying issues and hard to tackle. Sure. Mm -hmm. I found that uh, shocking and, and sad, and I wonder, does that predate, obviously you have information on the, the first use or the, the age of frequent use or mm -hmm. continued chronic use of methamphetamine, mm -hmm. does the violence predate the methamphetamine use, or is it concurrent, and it's hard to prove causality, mm -hmm. but you wonder, does physical and sexual violence predispose or put these poor women at higher risk of, you know, feeling low self-esteem, mm -hmm. an environment of high drug use, and then going into this for coping mechanisms or just an escape yeah. or what have you. Yeah, we're actually, that's a good question, and I don't have the answer to that because we're working on a publication as a result of these findings, but that's one thing we put on our list of things to do in terms of going back to the data to tease that out because that's very important. And, yeah, it would it would lend itself to at least describe, okay, we have the age at first use, we do have that, and the age at their first event. And it would provide some indication as to the, not temporality, but the trajectory in terms of their experiences. So yeah, we're gonna look at that. Okay, well, on behalf of students and faculty, a little token. Oh my this, goodness. But, uh, for those who want to continue this, uh, please come join us for lunch at the lobby of anti Instructional Research Building. Okay, thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank Appreciate you for having it. me. Thanks. <laughs>